and they, I remember one the first time I did this, he was an architect. So he's smart. He's intelligent. He could he knew the technique made him feel better, but he wasn't practicing. And I showed him the screen. He went, when I changed my breath, my heart did that. <laughs> and he was, how do I buy one of these? <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, this is our second time when we go in English and uh, the reason for that is that we have a very very special guest uh, from United States, uh, mm -hmm. Joseph Arpaia mm -hmm. and uh, same thing what it was in previous episode with Judith, uh, I heard 2015 about you from Harry the first time and also heard only good stuff after yeah, that. I paid him very much <laughs> to say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> good stuff after that. So that's why it's a, it's a great honor to get you here. And, uh, and, uh, but again, there's a lot of people who don't know who you are, especially in Finland. So can you please introduce yourself, what you do and, uh, why you do and so okay. on. Okay. Uh, well, in my day job, I'm a medical doctor uh, with specialty training in psychiatry and addiction medicine. And I have my own practice. So I see patients and uh, a lot of them are on medication and I will prescribe medication. But I also teach uh, my patients a lot of mental techniques that help them with both mental and physical conditions. So if I've got someone with, say, anxiety or depression, then I may be teaching them mental techniques to help with anxiety or depression. But a lot of my patients have chronic pain, and so I will teach them techniques that help them have less pain or less discomfort from the pain. Um, and I would say why I do it, I've, I've wanted to understand the mind-body connection since I was a very small child. Uh, mm -hmm. Why, I don't know, I just did. Um, yeah. And then uh, I like learning about the mind and understanding the mind more. And then I like teaching people how to use their mind more effectively and use it to solve you know, either problems in their life or just sometimes become more effective. Uh, not all my patients are um, struggling with illnesses. I, or some, I mean, some of the people I see aren't patients. Some people I work with are just uh, high functioning individuals or athletes and they want to get better. Okay, great. So awesome i have to say because uh, i have a lot of injuries in, in my past and uh, i see a lot of doctors and none of all the uh, all the respect none of them have speak anything about mind it's um, more about like you know the medicine and that kind of stuff so uh, can you please tell me what are the common technique uh, about what you use with your patient about mental mental training or methods the it varies a lot. And a lot of what I do is um, when someone comes in, I'm trying to get a sense as to what their language is. I want to yeah. communicate with them because if I just give a standard, this is, this yeah, is yeah, what yeah. you do, then for some people it'll work and some people it won't. So I have to learn how to speak their language because what we're talking about in the mind is not something you can see. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what may explain something for one person, another person will go, oh, I, I don't understand that at all. Yeah. Uh, so the first, uh, one of the things I do is try to get a sense of how to communicate these ideas to the other person. Uh, and then once we're communicating, then it's teaching them things. Usually the first step is something to do with their body, because as much as the mind affects the body, the body affects the mind. And one of the tools for affecting these, the body processes that we need to affect is the attention. So. Um, I can, I can tell me, or I can move my arm deliberately. Yeah. So if I want to reach out and grab something, I can, but if I need my heart to beat a little slower or I need my fight flight response to back off a bit, yeah. I can't just say beat slower or back off. It doesn't, it doesn't understand the same language, but if I place my attention on certain things, then my what we call the autonomic or automatic nervous system will respond. Um, so the first step is teaching people how to place their attention on certain processes to generate healthy effects. And that does two things. One is it starts giving them a sense that, oh, I can be healthier or they get better health. The other is they start getting a sense of, oh, what I do with my attention uh, or my breath 
has a bigger effect than just me thinking it helps or me feeling a bit more relaxed. Uh, about 20 years ago now, I started using heart rate monitoring in my practice because I found I could teach people, let's say a breathing technique and, and people say, oh, I just breathe. But if you breathe in this certain way with your attention like this, then you get this certain effect. And I could see the effect because I could see their, you know, their breathing rate would slow and their shoulders would drop and their face would relax and they would feel better, but they would be like, well, is it real? Yeah. I, I, is it real? Well, well, if you're feeling it, it's real. No, no, I don't. I, maybe it's just my imagination. And so I found when I put a little, I mean, just a blood flow monitor and the, and the, the program calculates the heart rate and shows it on the screen. And I would have per person do the technique and then I would show them the screen. I wouldn't have them look at the screen because the magic is here. The magic's in the person, not in the computer. Mm -hmm. So I'd have them do the technique. And then I would show them, now look. So when here's your heart rate when you were just resting or when you were talking or when you were thinking about your job or you were focusing on your pain. And here's what happened when you shifted your attention to your breath maybe or to some other soothing experience. And they, I remember one the first time I did this, he was an architect, so he's smart, he's intelligent. He could, he knew the technique made him feel better, but he wasn't practicing. And I showed him the screen, he went, when I changed my breath, my heart did that? <laughs> and he was, how do I buy one of these? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and it, it started him practicing. And so, because these are skills, and the more we practice skills, the better we get, and we get better faster, yeah. he got better a lot faster. And so, once I started shoot using the monitor to prove to people that they were actually doing something, then people started to improve faster. Yeah, yeah, that sounds 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 great because you know in in Finland we have that kind of phrase that uh, our population is like uh, engineering people uh -huh. in, in Finland. So <laughs> so and uh, I've been coaching in many organizations and that's I, I I see that it's very in, important to Finnish people that they have uh, some kind of uh, monitor where they can see that ah, actually okay. this work and it it's funny it goes like that because of course you can also feel it right. when when right. It, when when you start when you start to feel better but mm -hmm. still it's much more effective when you can see from monitor that actually yeah. that's yeah. happening my heart rate and and that's the thing and also for us it's very important that it's science scientific proved you right. know right. research some, yeah some research yeah. and it's not the uh, boo or something like that <laughs> so right. so yeah but that's how it goes so joe uh in your uh, work, do you see that people are more stressful nowadays than before? What do you think? Well, having uh, been practicing medicine for over 20 years, I would say that people have been stressed for at least that long. Okay, so and it's not a new thing. It's not a new thing. Uh, are they more stressed now? Maybe, I think, um, maybe more, more information coming in, mm. more stuff um, that makes them uneasy. Mm. But... Uh, I think the there's more knowledge about stress now. Back when I was uh, in medical school and starting medicine, there was sort of a, well, does stress really cause this stuff? Mm -hmm. And there wasn't as much concrete evidence that chronic stress that accumulates over time causes so many difficulties. So I think we're definitely more aware of it now. Yeah, yeah. So probably that's the reason why the media and everyone talk I about think more. So. I think so. I think uh, you know, people were stressed pretty badly. If, you know, I can't say before I went into medicine, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. since I've been in medicine, yeah, they've been stressed. Okay, okay. Uh, what is your advice to people who are stressed, uh, what, what they should do, what do you think? Mm. I think one of the problems we have with stress, and this is in trying to understand stress, this is uh, my own language yeah. for it, but uh, stress has is different things. So we use, we say, I'm under a lot of stress. And that usually refers to all the difficulties we have, the demands, um, all the tasks we have to do. Yeah. That's one kind of stress. Yeah. Another kind of stress will say, well, I feel stressed, yeah. which is sort of this feeling of Ugh, I didn't, I, kind of wanting to pull back from it. And I call that maybe unease. Yeah. And they're different. They're different in the brain. They're different in the body. They mm -hmm they arise out of different processes. And then there's the sort of, I'm stressed out or I'm, I'm just depleted. And it's sort of how our body feels from the stress. 
And that's a different component. I call it strain. It's the effect on the body from what's happening from the environment. If we try to treat all these the same, we get confused. Uh -huh. So then people say, well, there's good stress and there's bad stress. And there's, well, no, there's, there's demands that I can meet and there's demands that are too much for me. Yeah. So if I'm facing demands that I can meet and maybe I'm a little uneasy about it, but I'm pretty sure I can do it. That's what we often call good stress. It's a challenge. It's yeah. like, okay, let me get up for this. I can do yeah. it. And I do it and I feel good about doing it and I'm successful and I get all these endorphins and yes, that's, that's not good stress. That's demands that are doable with a moderate level of unease and a successful action. Yeah. Other kinds of stress that we often say are bad stress. Well, maybe there's no difficulty at all. Maybe yeah. it's, the, or the difficulty's mild. I can do it but I don't want to do it, oh, yeah, yeah. you know? So when I have to mow the lawn, you know, eh, it's hot outside, I don't want to do it. And so it feels stressful, but I have the energy. It feels stressful because I don't want to do it. Yeah. Well, that's a different, there needs to be a different solution. I need to motivate myself. Okay, it just be, I just go out and do it and then I'll feel better and my wife will be happy for <laughs> me for mowing the lawn instead of upset. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, th that's true. I heard a lot about that, uh, this uh, uh, last person, mm -hmm. about when people just don't like what they do. Is, mm -hmm. is there anything what you want to tell those people who have that kind of stress? <laughs> That it's difficult, but we have to separate difficulty and unease. And this is one of the, my, many of my patients have told me this is one of the most important things they've learned is that difficulty is, we look at what our environment and we assess it in terms of, okay, what is it important for me to accomplish? What are my values? What are my goals? And what are the obstacles? What are the demands that I have to meet in order to achieve my values or in order to express them? Yeah. What resources do I have to meet those demands? And if the demands are greater than the resources, I want to try to increase my resources or reduce the demands so that the tasks are manageable. Yeah. Now, the other side, if I'm unease, if I'm uneasy and I'm just uneasy, then there, I just have to be able to deal with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In other words, I have, to, and this is where unease affects the physiology. So there's this link, unease affects the physiology in a way that makes the unease feel worse. So there's this feedback loop. Yeah. My unease activates me and that makes the unease look worse and then and back and forth. And I have to realize that if unease is not tied to difficulty, then it's just unease. Yeah. And unease, if I relax, not so much relax, just, okay, um, it's safe to be uneasy. Yeah. There isn't any difficulty. There isn't any. One of, one of the people I wear, she said, well, I'm going on my way to work and I'm just, I, I'm uneasy. I don't know what's going to be facing me. She works in an ER. And she goes, but at the time, all I have to do is drive to work. There isn't any difficulty. I can drive to work. I have, I'm just uneasy. And so I've learned, okay, I'm just uneasy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just, I'm going to be uneasy as I go to work. I don't have to fix it. I don't have to make the unease go away. Yeah. It's just uncomfortable. And then with that attitude, it tends to go away on its own. The mind says, oh, I'll pay attention to something else for a while. Yeah, exactly. okay. So could we say that uh, nowadays problem is that somebody get the idea that we should feel happy all the time. We should feel good all the time. And actually that's why we are even more uneasy, you know, what do you think? Yeah, that's a very, I think that's an important question or yeah. important insight because part of what my, the, the difficulty comes from my expectations. So if I expect to be happy all the time, and I think I supposed to be happy all the time, and that's not even possible. Now the, the, the difficulty is impossible, it's not possible. Yeah. And so when difficulty is high, unease goes up. Yeah, so yeah. If it's impossible to feel happy all the time because this is planet earth and yeah. bad stuff happens. Yeah. And then my unease is gonna be high all the time and I can't ever get away from the stress. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, life has its ups and downs. And I think, you know, if I think about part of the possible problem with the, the social media, especially is yeah. people don't tend to post about the downs. You know, they yeah. tend to post about, oh, you know, life looks good. They always put their, you know, yeah. no one posts things. Well, maybe not no one, but yeah. the preponderance is positive. Yeah. And so it sets our expectation higher and higher and higher and higher. Yeah. And 
when we're doomed to be disappointed. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I see that, that, that that's a big problem nowadays, and uh, it's it's kind of paradoxical that actually you try to be more happy, and you are you, the result is that you are actually right. <laughs> less right. happy. Right. So, so, so can we say that uh, rather to try to be happy all the time, the better goal would be understand that uh, it's natural feel uh, not so happy all the time. Do you know what yeah. I mean? I think. Uh, one thing to do is look at what kind of meaning are we getting from our life? Are we having meaningful relationships? Yeah. And sometimes relationships are more meaningful when we've shared difficult experiences together. So uh, to look at not so I just want to be happy, but how can I look at something that's more uh, helps me be at peace with what's going on around me and helps me connect strongly with the people around me? Um, Happiness comes and goes, but, but if we can develop deep, meaningful connections with other people, I think that sustains us when things get difficult. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's true. Actually, nowadays I, I see that the individuals come more and more popular, and mm -hmm. uh, in other other level it's a good thing, but in other level probably not, because mm -hmm. like you said, deep, meaningful relationship it's pretty right. pretty more pretty much core thing with, with people want mm -hmm. to live a good right. life yeah right. uh, so uh, I know already uh, also that you are a uh, expert and uh, you very like what you do so uh, every time when I talk with with different genius uh, they have a uh, different topics which are very interested personally right now so what what is what uh, subject give you a good vibes or, or what are very passionate passionate um, but just well, I'd been, I'd been studying meditation for a long time and applying it in my private practice. And then um, when I got connected with Judith, yeah. it, uh, it, it gave me some very interesting questions. You know, how can this be applied? Um, because I was doing it clinically. How yeah. can it be applied for people in non-clinical situations, tactical situations? or And then more and more the general public. Yeah. And so working to communicate this in a way that is non-clinical, in a way that the average person can understand without needing one-on-one, -on -one, you know, doctor-patient kind of uh, relationship yeah. has been really a big focus now, how to make it more widespread. I, I asked that already from Judith, but also you, do you have an answer that, <laughs> well, how to do it? Um, in terms of how to do uh, how, how to communicate with uh, like uh, normal people that they get all this information and uh, start to doing it in their everyday life like i think it's uh there's lots of ways of explaining yeah. this and i think people have to be willing to explore different ways and if if something they're trying is not working then find another way of practicing or find yeah. someone else who explains it a little differently yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I have my way of explaining it, and that's changed over the years, and I've broadened it some way. Judith has hers, um, Hari has his, and I think it, with so much available, it's sometimes a little difficult. What do yeah. I, well, try something for a while, you'll learn something. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then if you feel like you're not learning anything more, pick up something else. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So people should be even a bit stubborn to... Yeah, you know, to, challenge it a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and try different stuff. Actually, I tell that my my own customers also. So uh, uh, just try different things, and uh, people are general smart. They understand oh, yeah. soon when when it starts to resonate, and, right. and just go go right. forward. And actually, what I see, many of my customers that uh, one of them first found a sleep, and one of them first found a nutrition, and mm -hmm. then when these people meet much more later. Uh, the, they can learn even more habits, but right. uh, but it's very very personal. Which point you get started right. to start to do right. better things. Right. But um, one more question. So um, our channel name is Successful Mind, and this is what we ask every time uh, end of interview. Uh, what do you think? How how you describe what is Successful Mind for successful you? Successful Mind. So I think of my mind as that that which enables me to be aware and that which enables me to learn. And so a successful mind is not just one that enables me to learn quickly, but it can change itself. 
So the mind is actually aware of itself and the processes it's using to experience and function. And it can look at processes that may need to be adapted or adjusted and change them. So it's the mind that changes itself that can be successful. It's not in one form, but it can recreate itself and change. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I steal that. No worries. So, um, great answer. Thank a lot. So, uh, one more thing. Uh, if people are more interested about you, where they can follow you or find oh, information okay. on what you do? Um, I have co-authored a book. It um, goes back a few years. Yep. It's uh, the, uh, the publisher called it Real Meditation in Minutes a Day. Um, I wanted to call it How to Kick Butt in a Butt-Kicking <laughs> World, but they said no. Um, perhaps because the Dalai Lama wrote the forward and it, he wouldn't be kicking anyone's butt. So, <laughs> uh, but it focuses on meditation as exercise for the mind. And then it gives some basic exercises and then shows how to use them to improve uh, health, performance, relationships, and spirituality. Um, in, in the book, I actually mentioned there's a website, uh, fullcapacityliving.com. And I, I've gotten a little bit out of the habit of putting up stuff, but I, I just try to put up anything I can think of that would be helpful. A lot of times it's for patients of mine, they're working on something and I just create something that might explain things for them. Sounds great. Uh, can people find that from Amazon? Uh, yeah, it's on Amazon. Okay, okay very good. So, uh, is there anything else what you want to say to people uh, there? Well, thank you for, you know, listening to the show. Thank yeah. you for giving me your time. And uh, I'd say play, take a playful attitude. Uh, to me, play is when I'm not keeping score. I'm just experimenting and trying things out and seeing, hey, this was cool. This was neat. It gave me some benefit. And I think if we have a playful attitude toward our mind, then we can learn much faster than if we're just trying to do it right. Exactly, exactly. So try to be too perfect. It's not a good right. plan. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that. But uh, thanks a lot for watching this. And, uh, and uh, we will see you next time. Thank you, Joe. Thank and, you. And uh, have a nice day. Bye-bye.